Good morning. Good to be with you again. We've been gone a couple weeks. Had a guest speaker at our church, and I'm glad to be back with you. We are continuing in Revelation. Uh, last week we did a review of Revelation uh, with our church family, and now we're continuing from chapter 17 into chapter 18 today. Um, last week we saw God begin to deal with uh, this, the world system that has always been that opposes Jesus Christ, uh, God's plan. Uh, the holiness of God and everything that God desires to accomplish and will accomplish. The world has always hated God's, God's will in their life. So now God is going to deal with the world, the system of the world, which is we live in. We live in it every day. It's a part of what we see, what we engage, uh, what we have to deal with, uh, the opportunities that we have. We live in a world system that is defined by uh, a defiance against God. That system will absolutely crumble here in Revelation at the end of the tribulation. God will judge. And so that's where we're at in Revelation 18. And we're at the second part. We see the world absolutely crumble here in the second half. We're reminded as we come here in Revelation, uh, Genesis chapter 11, we see the Tower of Babel. We see that systemic rise against God, that system against God. We see literal Babylon uh, take Judah into captivity, and they are judged by God in Jeremiah 51 and 52. And then we see Babylon represent all the empires that will come after her. We see that in Daniel very clearly. We see it in Revelation. Revelation completes the prophecies that Daniel shows us. Here in Revelation 17 and 18, we see that systemic uh, fall of Babylon, spiritual, religious, economic, commerce, political, everything is going to fall and come to pieces. God makes it absolutely clear in Revelation 14 that Babylon will fall. In fact, when he speaks here in Revelation 14, it's, it's, it's in the process of now coming to fruition. God's promises are being fulfilled. Babylon is in the process of being judged by God. The world is being in the process of being judged by God. Babylon is another term for simply the world, the system of the world, the governments of the world, the leadership of the world, the people of the world, to stand in defiance against God's will. And so we see that very clear here in Revelation 14, that judgment is coming. Revelation 16 just shows us uh, how deep that is. It is God remembering Babylon, her sins, God remembering how the world has defied him, from Adam and Eve and, and, and then systemically from the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 all the way through to the end of time. God is going to drain the, the cup of his wrath against the world. That's what we see taking place here. And so this chapter 19 is God's divine judgment. It's, it's the second piece of that coming to fruition. Um, and so we are seeing God fulfill his promise. His promises, the seal judgments, the... The trumpet judgments, now the bowl judgments. We see them being poured out and bringing ultimately to fruition the judgment of this world and Babylon. God's judgment is divine. We see that in chapter 17. We saw the collapse of religion in this world. You know, in, in Genesis 11, the world desired to come together to have one entity, one group, uh, one worship, and God is going to give the world what they wanted. He's going to give them that. But first, he's going to collapse religion across the world. All that will be left will be the Antichrist. And the world will yield to him and worship him. And ultimately, Satan. We saw that in chapter 17. The religions of the world will collapse. The Antichrist will destroy all of the other religions of the world. And he will rise to the top. He will rise. He will be the cream that will rise to the top. And he will have full authority for three and a half years. And the world will come under his, his leadership, his authority. Chapter 18 is what we see today, the collapse of the, of the system of this world as God knows it. God's going to judge. So this, this chapter is about judgment. It's about what God hates in this world. It's about his promised judgment. So let's look at that. The first thing that we see here in this chapter is that uh, Babylon is called out because of her sin. He calls her sin out specifically in many ways in this chapter. You need to have your Bible with you this morning. We're going to be going through uh, the scriptures together. In Revelation here, chapter uh, 18, verse 5 and 6, For her sins are heaped as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double 
for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup that she mixed. She's responsible for the judgment now being poured out upon her. God is paying her double. We see often a double inheritance, a double portion. This is a double curse. This is a double judgment being poured out upon uh, Babylon, upon the world, as it were. Because Babylon, again, represents every empire of the world, the system of this world. It uh, doesn't matter what political system. It doesn't matter what country. It is a system of this world that says, I hate God. I want to do things my way. God is judging that. It's interesting here in verse 5, her sins are heaped as high as the heavens. See, what God has done is, is he's turned their desires, their passions on their head. In Genesis chapter 11, they wanted to build a tower, as it were, as high as the heavens. Of course, they couldn't reach literal heavens, but they, they wanted to be known throughout the earth as, as having unique access to the God of heavens. He's turning that, that defiance of, of this world system on its head and saying, they have not reached the heavens in glory. No, what has reached the heavens is the sin that defines this world. Her sin is being called out. There's no hiding from God. We cannot hide from God. Time does not dilute God's memory. You know, his timetable is different than ours. He is now judging sin and ultimately sinners of all time. And here, specifically, the world system, the Babylonian Empire, Roman Empire, the revived Roman Empire, the entity that will be at the end of the tribulation. He's calling out her sin. So what is that sin specifically that he's calling out that has defined humanity uh, throughout its history? Well, we see this. We see her embraced uh, evil at its very worst. Verse 2, we see this. Um, she has become a dwelling place, that's Babylon, for demons. A haunt for every unclean spirit. A haunt for every unclean bird. A haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. She has embraced uh, evil at its, at its most wicked form. She has embraced the influence of the demonic world. This world today is driven by impulses that are driven by demonic forces. And our world systematically is more and more in embracing those things. And that's exactly what God is going to judge. He is reminding us that our sin is demonic. And he's reminding us that as sinners, we embrace those things unless Jesus Christ intervenes in our life. Not only that, in verse 3, we see this. Her sin for all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her and the sin here is simply the the sexual immorality that defines uh this world it has always been a part of this world and every culture defiance against god has often been expressed with sexual freedom uh sexual identity in this culture all kind of things we place those things as a priority in our life before god God's will, God's holiness. And the world says, I want to express myself sexually. I want to do whatever I want sexually. I want to be whatever I want sexually. And God is going to judge that expression. He's going to judge that sin. Sexual immorality often ties in directly to idolatry. It becomes an idol in our life. It becomes what we strive for more than anything else. And God is God is judging the, the sexual expressions of mankind throughout all history that culminate ultimately here in the tribulation every expression of evil there has ever been in the world is going to culminate culminate at its worst here at the end of the tribulation every empire that has ever been is going to culminate at its worst under the authority of the antichrist and satan evil will be at its worst at the end of the tribulation here that's exactly what we're seeing and god is judging sinners because of their sin here sexual immorality God hates sexual immorality he has called a man and a wife to be united together and sexuality to be expressed only within the confines of marriage and man has always always sought to undermine that that will of God not only do we see that we also see in verse 3 and then and and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living the sin of materialism, the sin of consumerism, the sin of living uh, for here and now, acquiring as much as I possibly can in this life, enjoying as much as I possibly can in this life, without pursuing at all the will of God, the heart of God, the glory of God, and life becomes about me. Here it's about things, it's about money, it's about what I can buy, what I can own, 
what I can use and, and discard and replace with something new. And God is going to sin, uh, judge this world because of its dependence upon its love affair with things. Things that we can't take with us to heaven. Things that ultimately uh, have nothing to do with our eternal destiny, but have defined our life. And as Americans, we are driven by materialism and consumerism, and God is going to judge that across the world and throughout history and here at the end. And we need to be looking at the sins and say, do these things define me? Do these things mark my life? God, may I deal with these things in my life and, and, and release these things to you and, and yield to you. Another thing that we see is in verse 7. And she glorified, she glorified herself and she lived in luxury. And, and so give her a, a like measure of torment and mourning. As she has poured out herself uh, to, to acquire as much luxury and things as she possibly can, she has poured out herself to fulfill uh, her wants and her needs. What he is judging here is man's uh, propensity to live for himself, self-affirmation and self-satisfaction. Uh, so the people would notice me, and the people would glorify me, and the people would see how much I have and how much I own, and the people would yield to me that I would be the one who has the power. And God, God is going to judge that sin of pride, that judge of, uh, of uh, living for myself, not considering others, but living for myself, using others in my life so that I can get ahead, so that I can benefit. That, again, is the wickedness of sin before God's heart. He's going to judge that. We see also in verse 7 this reality. She says, since in her heart I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and the morning and morning I shall never see. And what we see here is the sin of, of arrogance. We see the sin of denial. The world has always said, and, and those in leadership against God have always said, it's not going to catch up to me. There's no God. There's no accountability. I'm all powerful. I have control of my own life, my own destiny, my own path. Uh, I got to pull up my bootstraps, follow my own heart, do all of those things, be true to myself. And God's going to judge the sin of the heart that is, is given over to that worldview, to that mindset, that that propensity to say, you know what, I can do whatever I want, and God's not going to hold me accountable. God's God's not going to judge my sin. God God's not going to remember. God's going to forget. There is no judgment after life. There is no life after death. All those kind of things, and God's going to judge uh, man for for his arrogance because God's word has made clear what God has promised: God's grace and God's mercy, but also God's judgment. Here we have simply arrogance. I sit as a queen. I'm all powerful. There is no one who is all powerful. I am no widow. I've not lost. I have not lost. That's an arrogance. Nothing can happen to me. I'm invincible. I'm indestructible. Uh, sin. Verse 24, the last, the last verse of this chapter. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. And here we see the sin of hatred. Hatred for God. Hatred for his word is seen in the prophets. Their, their giving of God's word, a hatred of God's people. Simply here, uh, the world will be judged severely, a double portion of sin, because, a double portion of God's judgment because of their sin, their hatred of God's people, God's principles, God's truth. Our world today hates God's word. It hates his principles. It hates God's people. That is growing stronger every day. God is going to judge that, folks. Don't ever lose sight of that. God's going to deal with sin in this world. These sins ultimately are the, are the basis for sin that comes into our life of all kinds and all stripes. It's, it all comes back to these, these root elements, expressions of sin. God's going to judge that. And he reminds us and he shows us here in chapter 18 that that judgment's going to come quickly. When it comes, it's going to come quickly. Chapter 2, we see this. Again, he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. That's an expression of of finality that's an expression of completion it is happened it is happening it will take place look at verse uh, 8 and this for this reason her plagues will come in a single day death and mourning and famine in a single day it's going to happen in verse 10 at the end of that verse in a single hour your judgment has come verse 17 in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste verse 19 for in a single hour she has been laid waste. It's going to come suddenly. It's going to come quickly. 
these last seven years, there's going to be so much happening in this world, the judgment of God, and yet this ultimate, utter, complete judgment is going to come like that. And God is going to judge. And, and you know, throughout history, man has said, where's God? Where's, where's the Lord Jesus? Where's His coming? He said He was going to come. He hasn't come. And, and mocked God and mocked His Word and lived as though He'll never come. There's never going to be an accountability. And He shows us here there will be an ultimate accountability, and it will come quickly. Look at verse 9. Through, uh, we'll just read, start reading here. We're gonna, we see here, ultimately, the world system just collapse under the judgment of God. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her, that is Babylon, with the world, will weep. And they will wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. See, when they see God judge this world. And they will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon. See, religiously, God has already acted against this world. Now it's only the Antichrist. Now the world system, the commerce, will collapse. And for in a single hour your judgment has come. The merchants, verse 11, of the earth weep and they mourn for her. Since no one buys their cargo anymore, there's no, there's no market, there's no, no one to buy anymore. The system has absolutely fallen apart. Cargo of gold and silver and jewels and pearls and fine linen and purple cloth and silk and scarlet cloth and all kinds of scented wood and, and articles of ivory and articles of costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spice and incense and myrrh and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves. And that is in human souls. And you see here all this expression in, in cell phones and computers and, and corporations. That, you, know, you get the idea. Everything is going to, and slavery is going to be, again, a part of the expression of mankind. It's never left. Man's propensity to want to own others. And even human souls being under slavery, it says, you're under the bondage of sin. Verse 14, the fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you. Everything you ever you put your hope in, your trust in, your longing in, it's disappeared. All your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you. Never, never, and never, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, her lashing out in these last moments, weeping and mourning aloud, alas, Alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. All shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors, and all whose trade is on the sea stood afar off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and they mourned and they cried out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. God is yanking uh, the value of materialism from, out, from under man. Now, now there's simply no market. People, people, because of these utter devastating judgments of God, people don't have the money to buy the things that would, that would be marketed. God is destroying commerce, destroying literally the cities of commerce. He, he is bringing physical destruction, economic destruct, destruction, political destruction, commerce destruction. He, is, he will bring destruction to this world and everything will fall apart. You'll go through your cities and they will be absolutely laid waste. And there will be no malls, and there will be no stores, and there will be no places, and you will have no money, and you will, you will have money maybe to barely even survive, and not even that, to eat. It's going to be devastating in every way. The world system will absolutely collapse, and, and, the, and this network of, of societal care for people who are homeless or needy is going to collapse, and the system is going to collapse. The world will collapse. God is judging this world. That's what's taking place here in this world. And it's absolutely complete. Look at uh, chapter 8, second half of that. And she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. God has, God is judging her. His judgment is complete. It is a double portion. It is thorough. It will not, left, it will not leave any sin unjudged. 
in his timetable here. Verses 21 and 23. And then a mighty angel, and many mighty angels here in Revelation, took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, that great city, be thrown down with violence. You know, Babylon, we believe, I believe biblically, prophetically, Babylon itself as a city will not be revived or rebuilt. There's, we, we already looked at that here. There are prophecies that indicate clearly that Babylon itself will not be rebuilt. But again, Babylon is, is a, uh, a prototype of all that will come after her as uh, Hollywood is an expression of everything that comes out of media today. It, it is an expression of all the wickedness, all the sin in this world. So whatever city this literally is, and the cities that this literally is will be destroyed. Verse 22, And the sound of harpists and mus musicians and flute players and trumpeters will be heard in her no more. No joy. No joy of music. And a craftsman of any kind will be found in you no more. No artisans. No art. Nothing of that expression. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. No, no manufacturing. No work. It will be destroyed. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. The electric grid, all the power grid, destroyed. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will be heard in you no more. No celebration. Um, none of those things that are a part of culture and life. There will be no time, no place, no opportunity for those things. Those will be swept off the wayside. For life will just be survival only. Your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And the deception that Babylon has brought on this world in every generation, this world has deceived every generation by its, its sin, will be destroyed. The judgment of God will be complete. It ultimately will bring the world to its knees. And we will see that at the end here as Jesus Christ comes back. Jesus Christ has kept his word. That's the promise. That's the beauty of what we see here. There is beauty in this judgment. There is horror in this judgment. Sinners are being judged. Folks, that's the most sobering reality of Scripture. That God will judge sin and sinners. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, God has promised he will judge your sin. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, Jesus Christ has taken that judgment upon himself. You and I will be accountable. We will give an account for how we have lived. We will be given reward and blessing for how we have lived well for the Lord and lose reward and blessing for how we have not. But we will not be judged like this. But it still is a call to a Christian to live faithfully and for the glory of God. Verse 20 tells us something important here. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets. See, those are the very ones in verse 24 that have been slaughtered by the world. Here in verse 20, you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Often we have seen already here in, in this tribulation scene at the temple of God, at the throne room of God, the martyrs who have been martyred out of the tribulation, those who have gone before and crying, God, how long until you judge? How long? How long? How long? And the prayers of the saints being collected in, in bowls that are precious to Jesus Christ, to God the Father. The prayers of the saints throughout all history are collected. Those are now being answered in the judgment of God. God has kept His Word. How significant that is. You know, when people say, God's, there's no hell. God won't judge. There's no afterlife. The Word of God tells us the truth and says there is. God is a God who will keep His Word. God is a God who is holy. God is a God who is worthy to judge sin because He was worthy to be the provision for sin. He gave His life for sinners. When you, when you consider the horror of what's happening here and the, and the millions upon millions of lives that are not dying in God's judgment, you need to, you need to sh re show and remember and consider the other side of that coin. That as God is judging sin, He has provided to every sinner, to every individual, an opportunity to know grace, to know forgiveness, to have a relationship with Him and be protected from the ultimate judgment, separation that sin brings against God. 
And then we see simply the result of this is just that God is glorified in every way. We see it in, in, in a small piece. We see it in contrast. And then we see it just blossom into fruition in a celebration that is beyond words. Look at verse 1. And I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was made bright with his glory. This is a mighty angel. And the glory that he has ultimately is not his own. It is a reflection of God's glory through him. It is a reflection of the glory of God. For all glory goes to God, not even to the angel. But the glory that has been given him is sufficient enough to light up this whole world. I believe this is literal. I believe there's a change here. I believe for a moment in time, we have, we have again, a miraculous intervention into the experience of man during the tribulation. And this angel comes from heaven. He has authority ultimately to, to do this. And for a moment in time, the world is lit up in, in his glory, which ultimately is the glory of God. You contrast that to verse 7. Babylon, the world, has sought to glorify herself and live in luxury. This world is about self. This world is about you following your dreams. The world's demand on your life is just be true to yourself. Forget that there's a God. Forget that there's Jesus Christ. The world allows and accepts religions to be ex expressed until the Antichrist comes. That's a different story. But the world, even as a system today, hates any expression of Christianity, of Jesus Christ, that he is the one true God, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. The world hates that and will hate you because you believe that. It will hate you because you express the love, the grace, the truth of Jesus Christ. Because the world's desire is to do what it wants. The world says to you, be true to yourself. Live how you want to live. Whatever that expression is, it doesn't matter what that is. Don't hurt someone else, but be true to yourself. That's, that's the message of this world. That is defiance against God's will and God's truth from his word. God will be glorified and praised. Well, we see that here in Revelation. Because we come to chapter 19, and this is, this is, this is the response to chapter 17 and 18. And after this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, and crying out, Hallelujah! <laughs> Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. See, the expression here isn't, isn't sorrow over sinners being lost. It is, it is rejoicing over God fulfilling his program, his plan, and now bringing his kingdom into completion of God doing what he promised he would always do throughout history. God is now honoring his word, and God is being celebrated because he is holy and just. He is right. He is worthy to do what has just happened, and now he is bringing his promises to fruition for the child of God. The expression of worship is because God is God and he's doing what he said he would do. For his judgments are true and just, verse 2. And he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality. Sin has always corrupted this, this earth. The system of this world has always corrupted the people of this world and sought to pull them away from Christ. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Babylon. God's judgment. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down. And they worshipped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah! And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you servants, you who fear him, small and great. See, those who are praising God here have feared God. They have feared God by giving their lives to Jesus Christ. They have feared God by yielding to him and to his grace and to his love. They have feared God by walking in obedience to Jesus Christ. They have feared God by being true to his word. They have feared God by reverencing Him and honoring Him and being a testimony for Him to others. And now they, and now they are in the place of, of honoring God, praising God, rejoicing in God, lifting up God, because they have glorified God and all that they did. They were not perfect. They sinned like I sinned and like you sinned. 
But they have been found to be true and genuine in their faith in Jesus Christ. And God is now honoring that faith and giving them, giving us the privilege of expressing, expressing love and worship and gratitude and glory and honor to Him. Because He is now going to bring in the fulfillment of God's Word in the Millennial Kingdom and then eternity where sin is eradicated for all time. It's a beautiful thing. This passage ultimately is one of destruction. Folks, you need, you need to live in such a way that people understand through your life and through the words from your mouth that God's Word is true. God hates sin. He'll deal, he'll, he's going to deal with sin. He's going to judge sin. He's going to judge sinners. This is the end of the tribulation, but God still judges now. When I, when I end this life, if I do not have Jesus Christ as my Savior, God will judge me. I will be separated from Him forever. I will be under His judgment forever because of the sin of my life because of my rejection of Jesus Christ. That's the truth of God's Word. You need to live with a sense of urgency. People need to know they need the Lord. People need to know that there is a Savior who has been given to wash their sins, to forgive their sins, to cleanse their sins, to make them whole, and to set them on a path of living for Christ. You and I need to express that to our children, and our grandchildren, and the people around us. We need to be faithful to that. We need to give God glory about how we live our life. Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest. The first expression of the angels when Jesus Christ was born was that. Glory to God. The Word of God is about that. It's about glory to God. Everything. Every way. It is glory to God in every expression. It doesn't matter what we do. Whether we eat or drink or whatever we do or whenever we do it or however we do it. Whatever we do, it's to be done. So that God is honored. God is glorified. That means we have to reject we have to reject the message, the impulses, the world views of the world around us. We have to say no to that sin, to those sinful thoughts, those sinful world views, those sinful expressions. We have to say no to those things. Say, Lord, I will honor you. I will honor your word. I will glorify your word. If I'm eating or drinking, and that's context here of of um, those gray areas of life. Should I eat meat that's been offered to idols or not? That's context here in the New Testament. In the areas of Christian liberty, I need to first and foremost think if I have in any area of liberty or any area of, of obedience or holiness, I need, to, I need to ask this question, be mindful of this. Will I honor God by how I do this? Or if I do this, will it honor God? If I think this, will it honor God? If I say this, will it honor God? If I live this out of my life, will it honor God? doesn't matter what I do. As a believer, this needs to be my heartbeat, your heartbeat. Our heartbeat must be this. God, will I honor you with this? Will I honor you by being quiet? Will I honor you when I speak up? God, help me to honor you in everything. That's what this is all about. John 17, the Lord said this about his testimony, his life, and it needs to be our expression as well. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. That needs to, be, that needs to be our desire, our passion, our testimony. That's how we honor the Lord. You need to be a student of God's Word, not to be biblically illiterate, not to have... Do you, have, do you know God's Word? Are you growing in your understanding of God's Word to your life? Is God's Word more important to you than social media? Is God's Word more important to you than His Word being poured into your life? Is it more important to you than His principles and His truth? His truth needs to define your life. It's written. God didn't give us a TV show. God didn't give us a movie. He didn't give us a miniseries. He didn't give us a, a video expression. God didn't, didn't give us podcasts. God didn't give us Instagram. Except He shows His glory through creation. He shows His glory through people. He shows His glory through experience. But if you want to know the truth of God, the specific truth of God, you must read His Word and understand His Word. You and I need to be a student of His Word so we can understand His will for our life. How can we say this? I glorified you. I accomplished what you gave me to do. If we don't know what He gave me to do. Ignorance, ignorance will not protect me from the discerning judgment of God in my life. The accountability in my life. When I stand before God and say, I didn't know, He'll say it was right here. To this Word you are held accountable. May we glorify God in everything that we do and how we do it. May the Word of God just permeate our life in every way. May it just guide us. May it, may it be the wisdom of our life. 
May it be the strength of our faith. May it drive us to Jesus Christ. That's my prayer for you. Consider the truth of what happens here and say, Lord, I thank you that you're dealing with sin. Lord, I want to honor you. I want to live for you. Help me to do that. God, give me the passion to desire to, to follow after your heart so that I will be blessed and, and honored before you because I have honored your name. And God, give me, give me a passion for people who need the Lord so that their end will not be this end. I want to see them come to know Christ. Use me to do that. Thank you for joining with me. It's so good to be with you again. And uh, we'll continue to, to finish revolution, uh, Revelation and move through. I'm looking forward to that, excited about that, and I'm glad we can be together. We'll be with you next week, and uh, thank you for joining with us again.